Hallelujah. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Minister Robert. Um, pastor ordained me back in 2017 at one of the conferences. Um, some of you guys have heard my testimony. Some of you are new. I, um, I come from a long line of dope dealers, drug addicts, alcoholics. Yesterday, well, Friday night, I don't normally get on Facebook, but I got on Facebook and uh, I get a message from my oldest friend. We went to high school together. I sold drugs with this guy. I did things that of criminal nature with this guy. <laughs> That's how far back we go, 40 plus years. He's in the hospital. A quarter of his heart isn't working. And they want me to come pray for him. So I said, okay, I'll be there. Went down. I anointed him. I prayed over him. Him and his daughter got saved. Amen. Thank you. Can you come get me next week to go to church? Yes, I can. All right. So God works in ways that we sometimes don't even see. Because I've been praying for this guy for years. Amen. And God showed me something. The sermon I, I'm pre preaching today, I, I always give my, name, my, my sermons a name. And it's My Want or God Has. That's what the name of the sermon is today. My Want or God Has. So let's go ahead and pray and invite God to come to this sanctuary. Lord, we come before you. We thank you, Lord God. We ask that you would anoint this word, Lord God, that you would touch hearts of your people, Lord God. Anoint them, Lord God with wisdom and understanding, Lord God, of what you have to say today, Lord. For I am the clay, you are the potter, Lord God. Use me. I submit and I humble myself before you, Lord God. Let it be your words and not mine. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. About two and a half, well, about two years ago, my life pretty much was falling apart. Me and my ex-wife, we left the church, we kind of church hopped, and it seemed like I wasn't going nowhere. I knew God had a calling on my life, but I stepped out of that calling because of my want. What do I want? Because sometimes I see my want is greater than what God has, and we all do that. But you have to ask yourself, does the want that you have align up with God's will? Because most of the time, it doesn't. We're a selfish people. In the Civil War, when the British were fighting us, they said that we were a unique people, that we were selfish British military army said that about America. And to this day, it's still true. I don't care about my neighbor. I don't care about the guy who's standing on the corner asking for help. That's me. But when I step in God's will, I see what God has. I see the couple dollars in my wallet that, you know what, I'm doing okay. My rent is paid. I got a roof over my head. I got food in the fridge. But my want, I'm going to hang on to my $2. That is hard. Because we're called to be a people that give. Jesus stepped out and gave to 5,000 fish and bread from a few loaves and a couple of fishes. The meaning of want is a desire of something. The expression of our want or desires to wish, desire, demand, longing, or yearning. I know we all long for a better life. We yearn for things that come in our lives. We look at the neighbor because he just bought a new truck or a new car, 
And man, I want a new car. I want a bigger house. In James 4, 1 through 3, it says, What is causing the quarrel and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get, to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have it, what you want, because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all, your motives are all wrong. You want what you will give let me say that again. You want only what you will give, give you pleasure. How many of us is that true? What's going to give me pleasure is my want. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm a selfish person. But I got to step out of sight of me. And I got to see what God has. Because God says, I have an abundant life for you. I have eternal life for you. I have blessing. I have gifts. I have people that you need to reach out to that you won't reach out to. That's the hardest thing. I have a tendency, and I don't know if some of you guys don't know this, but I love quotes. I like to read quotes. I love to see quotes. A man isn't scared to stand for God. He is scared where God will make him stand. Paul said, fight the good fight. But I keep seeming to be knocked out. Because I'm fighting and there's days I pick myself up off the ground and I look at myself in the mirror and I say, Lord, I need your strength because I'm weak. I got divorced seven months ago. God gave me a heart of flesh, took away the heart of stone. Most men won't admit it, but I am. I'm broken. I'm weak. And there's days I feel like a failure. But in that brokenness, when I fail, God steps in and I overcome. God has taken me lifted me up, raised me up, pulled me out of the miry clay and set my feet on the rock. I know that my want can become a dangerous desire when we allow the enemy to take the word of God and use it against us because we start believing the lie. You're a failure. You got divorced. You're broken. No one can use you. But God takes my brokenness and he uses it. Because I can't even see that. Sometimes God just moves in a way that we can't even understand. In Exodus 20, verse 5, it says, and if a servant, up, oh, wrong chapter, there we go. 
See, I even make mistakes. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For the Lord thy God am I a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. My want affects my children's children's children. Because my sin does not put me in line with God. But God has taken me, cleansed me, redeemed me, washed me in the blood, and set me free. (laughs) But yet I still want. That's the hardest thing to let go, is my want. Because I want a better life for my kids. I want a better life for me, for my grandchildren. But then God will humble you when your 12-year-old granddaughter comes to you and says, Grandpa, who's God? Well, apparently I'm not doing my job right. Because it's taken 12 years for even her, for her to hear about it. But I've changed that. My youngest granddaughter, who's five, now sits at the table. When we sit down to eat, even at a restaurant, Grandpa, we need to pray. Yeah. Okay, you pray. See, these are the blessings God gives me that I don't even see because of my want. But this is what God has. The things we will do when we don't have something and we want it. I believe it's because we look at the world and see a bigger house, a nicer car. We want the world what the world has. And we forget what God has for us. He's given us blessing and the gifts. And when we take our eyes off of God, I believe that when we look at the world, we start believing the lies. If you want it, you got to go out and get it. You got to work harder so that you can afford it. But yet, countless times, I've sat and I've stood up here and said, you know what? God has blessed me financially. March 15th, I lost my job. But I made a choice and I said, you know what, God? You are my Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. I'm going to stand on your word and your promise and I'm going to say, you said. Friday they called me and said, hey, one interview. That's all I did was one interview. We want you. When can you start? So I decided to take a week's vacation, and I'll start April 3rd. (laughs) Because God is providing. God has my finances. I want more finances, but God is saying, you know what? Trust in me. Because sometimes... Just paying the rent, the lights, the car, the insurance is a blessing from God because you made it. See, we we think that everything has to be right now. We think that everything we do is right now. See, I love to write quotes too. Even when I'm just driving and something comes to mind. It says, uh, when you want something you never had, God would tell you to do something you've never done. That came out of this little peanut. And I read it time to time, and I read my quotes that I write, and I'm like, dang, that's profound. But then I realized it isn't me. It's God giving me wisdom and knowledge because I'm willing to submit to a God who has redeemed me. He took my want and gave me his has. It's not easy. I know. I know it's not easy serving God. Because we were promised trials and tribulations. 
And believe you me, these last two years, I've been in nothing but a trial. I'm like, Lord, when's it going to end? And I keep asking myself, God, what do you have for me? Because your has is bigger than my want. I think this scripture that I'm going to read, I think this is one of the most scriptures that is misunderstood. And when we say it, we truly don't know the meaning behind it. Because it sounds good. We think of prosperity, we think of our need, we think of our want, and this scripture tells me, guess what? In John 14, 13 and 14, you can ask anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. You ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. But we just hear the last part of that. Ask and you shall receive. But what do I got to do to receive it? I got to bring glory to the Father and to the Son. That's the part that I leave out. Because is my want, is it glorifying God? Nine times out of ten, not even close. Like I said, I'm a failure. I'm broken. There's days I feel like Everything that I live for has been betrayed. And I keep hearing these words because I used to say this to my kids. I was a, I'm a vet. Suck it up, private, and drive on. Reach down in that Kool-Aid pump and heart of yours and move on. Because that's what I used to hear. But then God showed me something. See, the military takes a person, and when you go into boot camp, they break you down. When I went and I joined, and I was in boot camp, I was running before I went, man. I could run three miles in 12 minutes. I'd run around Sloan's Lake in, I think, 12, almost 13 minutes, and that's good. That's excellent. I mean, I was in good health. I could do that. But then when I went in, it wasn't a physical game. It was a mental game. We would be standing in formation in our barracks, and we just got done cleaning the whole place, man. I'm talking the floor was clean and white, and it was glistening. And our drill sergeant would come in. We'd all be standing at attention. But nobody would see her do what she did. She'd put polish on the sides of her boots, and she'd go and stand in front of her door, and she'd just mark up the floor. Oh, you guys can't clean the floor in front of my door? Just everybody get on down and start pushing. So we would push, butterflies, all this stuff, till the floor was nice, glistening, wet. Oh, now you want to wet my floor with your sweat? It was a mental game. When you come to God, we think roses and butterflies. But he's going to break you down first. And then build you up. Amen. All the sin that you've done, he's got to take away. He bore it on his shoulders at Calvary. My sin, my impurity, my hatred. Because I'm a liar, I'm a thief, I'm a murderer. The Bible says that if you've thought these things in your heart, you've committed them. I've broken the Ten Commandments and probably more. Probably 631. But God has forgiven me. And I don't know anybody who has forgiven me that much. What I learned this last year and a half I had to forgive somebody I loved for hurting me in a way that most people would have done something else. Don't, don't get me wrong. It crossed my mind because I'm a man. 
Before all, I'm a man. Before I'm a preacher, before I'm a minister, before anything, I'm a man. And when you hurt me, believe you me, I'm going to hurt you back. But that was the old me. The new me, that person who did me wrong, I'm going to go to the hospital and I'm going to pray over him. I'm going to anoint him. I'm going to do the things that God has called me to do. And step out of me, step out of my want. Because God has called me to do his has. God has blessing and honor for all of us. Beyond compare. True forgiveness, people say you can forgive, but you, you'll never forget. That's the human side of it. True forgiveness is when you start forgiving people the way God forgave you. He took your sin as far as the east is from the west, and that's not in a circle. That's a straight line. And he cast it into the sea of forgetfulness and remembers it no more. Do you forgive like that? Because I don't. There's times where I don't. But God has showed me. Let it go. Why are you walking around with that yoke on your neck when I've asked you to give it to me? That's very hard. I haven't preached since we were over at Berkeley Park. I've done offering. But through that whole time, I've still ministered to people. It confounded me how I'm going through a breakup, a divorce, and God's putting people in my life that are suffering the same thing. Am I going to talk to them out of my desire and hatred for what I'm going through? Or am I going to do God's will? And believe you me, the first thing out of my mouth is I'm not here as your friend. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. If you're doing wrong or she's doing wrong, then you need to get right with God. It's not easy. It's not. Because I want, I want to feel hurt because I want that other person to hurt. I want them to feel pain. I want them to feel the loneliness the brokenness, the failure that I feel. But you know what? I decided to give it all to God. We can't see the whole picture. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And we say, God is far from me. And I would tell you, it's not because God moved. It's because we've moved. God says, draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. Old English, in other words, if you draw closer to me, I will draw closer to you. I was at a job, and I was working, and they used to have this long hallway down the back of the building. And one day, I'm walking down the building, and I just start speaking in tongues. And I got drunk in the Holy Spirit. Literally, I'm, I mean, I'm walking down the hallway, and I'm just like, whoa, Lord. That's when everything is going right, and we're just like, Lord, oh, my God, you're on the throne. And then we turn the corner, and we see that person we don't like. God cast him down. Fire and brimstone, Lord. That's how quick your, your, your feelings can be messed up. I love it. Because God's shown me that my want can never compare to his has. Hebrews 13.8.
Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't move. I move. I choose to be out of the will of God. I choose to to decide to go to the bar and have a beer and get drunk. That's my decision. The Holy Spirit's not going to tell me, hey, Super Bowl time, let's go to the bar. Super Bowl time, let's have a house party. Can you see the abundance in the midst of your trial? Not even close. Because I can't see God's abundance. Because I took my eyes off of him. The only thing you see is the hurt, the pain, and what you're going through at that moment. I know there are those that would say, you have to keep your eyes on God. You have to fight the good fight, trust in God's will. But when was the last time you just sat with a brother and sister and listened to them? And Job... In Job 2, 9 through 13, you you hear the story of Job. This man was tested, and he lost everything. Everything. Livestock, camels, servants, sons, daughters. But why not his wife? Why didn't he lose his wife? Because most of us, if we were to lose our spouse, we'd fall apart. And I can testify. My second wife, her name was Tammy. She got killed in an accident. I was only 31. I spent six months at the bottom of a tequila bottle. Because it devastated me. And I'm not going to lie, I curse God. God, why did you take the best thing in my life? And you know what God said? Who are you to ask me? Because I wasn't even serving God. I knew who God was. I was a backslider. I knew who God was. At the age of 14, in a church that had no power, and when I say that, I'm talking, they believed in salvation, but that was it. No speaking in tongues, no laying on the hands of the sick, none of that. But I came to God and I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to serve you. And God said, okay, I'm going to keep you to your word. A few years later, I came into Pastor Ron Simpkins' church. And I'm not going to lie, when I met my wife at the time, I seen her down on the 16th Street Mall, and she was looking good. I'm telling you. She looked like Pat Benatar, young. The same haircut, everything, man. I was like, dang, I'm going to hook up with that girl. The words out of her mouth were, if you want to go out on a date with me, you have to go to church. I was a Catholic. No problem, man. I get on my knees, a few Hail Marys and hallelujahs, and I'll be all right. We went to Pastor Simpkins' church. (laughs) Guess what, son? I got something else for you. Okay, God. Smacked right between the eyes. Two weeks later, man, I'm on my knees. I'm praying, receiving the Lord. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? I was a guy who wore a trench coat, carried a gun, because you never knew what was going to happen in the people I mixed with. I left all that. I walked away from a life, and when I say crime, I'm saying crime. I walked away 
Here one day, gone the next. Nobody knew where I was at. Nobody. I disappeared. But God found me, picked me up, dusted me off, cleaned me up. And I served God probably for a few years, went through a divorce, fell apart, backslid. 20 years, God called me back. I walked into Pastor Dave Clare's church, and then I came to Pastor Mesta's church. When I got ordained that night, Pastor Ron Simpkins walked up to me, prayed over me, and he looked at me straight in the eye and he said, it's about time you got here. That's the night I was being ordained. He said, you decided to go the long way around, but you got here. So if you think God's calling on your life that you messed up back then, can't come to flourishing today, test God. Call on Him. I'm going to pick on Tara, Minister Tara. She goes way back where I come from. And when you see what God has done in this woman's life, tell me there's not a God. Tell me there's not a God who I serve, who took me, cleaned me up, dusted me off, and said, I have a life more abundant. I have blessing. I have gifts. You know, I was thinking, like I said, about Job's wife. Why didn't she die? And I read that, and it just, God speaks to me in times when I'm just like, Lord, whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down. I'm not that bright. (laughs) And he spoke to me and he said, you know what? When Satan came to me and I said, test Job, but you cannot kill him. Why didn't he kill his wife? And this is what God told me. Because God sees it as two shall become one. I've heard pastors preach on other items, and that just profoundly blew me away. Job's righteousness covered his wife. She couldn't even be touched because Satan has to obey the laws of God. This man lost everything, and in all that, he still didn't sin against God. His wife even said, you know what? Curse God and die. If my wife told me that, that would break me. That would make me feel like, guess what? You're not worth living. You're not with me even being around. Curse God and die. Get it over with, would you please? But then three of his friends, they heard of his situation, and they came and sat with him for seven days and didn't say a word. How many of us have sat an hour with a friend and kept our mouth shut and just listened while they poured their heart out? We sometimes think we know all the answers when we get saved. I know some of you guys have heard about the Roman road. It walks you through the prayer so you can save somebody, lead them to salvation, so they know who God is. But most of the time, we can't even get to the Roman road. You know, ACDC had a song, Highway to Hell. Led Zeppelin had Stairway to Heaven. You ever realize that that stairway is really thin? For the road is broad. 
but the gate is narrow. You know, there, when Jesus talks about the parable of the sheep, there's a part in there that we all probably miss that says where we can go and come in to the pastures. God allows you to go and come. If you want to leave, leave. He's not going to hold you down. But if you come, you're put into a pasture where you are fed, where you are taken care of, where you are clothed. We don't see all of this. We don't. And I'm the first to admit it. I'll be the first to say it. I'm a failure. But like I said, God has taken that failure and put him here. I'm not wise. I didn't go to seminary school. But from what I read and what I learn and what God shows me, I'm blown away. So you have to remember that not everything you're going through is of the enemy. God will give you trials and tribulations so that you can grow in your walk with him. We give the devil more credit than he deserves. He's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at one time. He took a third of heaven with him, and he might dispatch them, but even they can't do you nothing. We do it to ourselves most of the time. We send ourselves on mind banders and mind trips and mind games, and we look at things, and we're just like, oh, my God, what mess did I get myself into? Does my want line up with God's will? That new house I buy, can I afford it? That new car I have, can I make the payments and the insurance? Because God will bless you in the most significant ways that just blow your mind. Last year in June, I got rear-ended, totaled my car. I'm like, Lord, I get a new vehicle, I'm going to be paying probably a couple hundred dollars more. More insurance, I couldn't afford it. So I went to a car dealership, and I see this, my vehicle, and I'm like, okay, Lord, the insurance said next week is when my check comes, so if you want me to have this vehicle because I liked this vehicle, and it was a pretty vehicle. And I knew that it would kind of put a thorn in my ex's back because of the color. My want, my want, because it's her favorite color. But I said, okay, Lord, if that car is here next week, that's my car. So the following week, I go back, and the car's there, and the guy's like, it's not even for sale. <laughs> what? I said, are you sure? So he looks and he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. It is for sale, it's just not on the list. I'll take it. I got a new vehicle. But here's the clincher. My payment went down $30. Or no, wait, my payment went up $30. My insurance went down $70. Wait, God, I'm still in the positive here. I don't get it. But that's how God works. My want or his has. He has a new vehicle for me. But you got to be patient. Wait on the Lord. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. You don't have them. God's adding them to you. In Galatians 5.24, those who belong in Christ, Jesus, have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. 
When you came to the Lord, you took your sin and you put it upon the cross. So why are you tr still trying to pick it up? But I'm not pointing at anybody. I'm pointing at myself because I've done it. Nobody knows what I do in secret. But God does. So I try to make my life apparent. I don't want sin in my life. I'm not saying that I haven't sinned. But I don't want to cling to the old Robert. He was buried at that baptism. Up came a new man. So why am I trying to dig up the dead guy? And believe you me, sometimes some of us have two shovels. We can't dig fast enough. In Matthew 5.45... In that way, you will be acting as true children of, the, of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. That person you're looking at next door who's got a bigger house, a nicer car, God still pours his rain on the just and the unjust. Who were you to question what they have. Your question should be, hey, are they saved? Because that's the hardest thing. In today's society, I don't even know my neighbors. I mean, I do, but the world. I don't want to get involved. I don't want to know you. Because if you have problems, guess what? I have to deal with them. There are times when I myself question who God is in my life. Because there's been times where I was face down on the floor, sobbing like a little kid, broken, despair, and God's not answering today. But then God showed me. The teacher's always silent when you're going through a test. But God, this test is hard. God, this test is something I can't handle. But God says, I, will give, I won't give you anything that you can't handle. Really, God? Really? Come on. So, in closing, I'm going to say, ask yourself, is my want bigger than what God has? Because sometimes it's okay to want things. It's okay to desire things. I'm not saying it's wrong. But what I'm saying is that line up with the will of God. Because I don't want to be outside God's will. I see people who have left God's will and they are broken and they are lost. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you're here today and you don't know God. You don't know who God is in your life. <coughs> And you would like to know who God is today. If you would like to accept salvation, I ask you to raise your hand. Let's see that hand. Let's see that hand. If you raise your hand, I want you to say a simple prayer with me. I'm not going to ask you to stand up because God knows who you are. God knows your heart. It says, Father God, 
Forgive me, for I am a sinner. I ask that you come into my life and into my heart. Save me, change me, and set me free from the bondages of sin, death, and hell. Be my God, and I will be your servant. In Jesus' name.